The following program is from NET, the National Educational Television Network. The legend of the antebellum South. Elegant Neo-Grecian mansions. Coquettish bells under the magnolias. Dancing with young men, gallant and reckless, ready to duel for a lady's honor. The kindly master ruling his kingdom with justice and humanity. And served by his faithful, contented puckies. Davis. I was born in Cogdale, Georgia. The South and the Southern way of life has always been an enigma, a kind of sphinx on the American land, one writer said. White people speak of their way of life with pride and affection. But one white man from Maryland, H.L. Mencken, wrote, fundamentalism, Ku Klux Klan, revivals, lynchings, Ogwala politics, these are the things that always occur to a northerner when he thinks of the South. What is the southern way of life? Is it based on the myth or the reality of the past? Did it ebb its life away at Shiloh and Gettysburg? Or does it still live for the 43 million whites and 11 million Negroes who live there today? I love the South a man said in 1958, I don't choose to live anywhere else. There's land there where a man can raise cattle. That's what I'm gonna do someday. There are lakes where man can sink a hook and fight the bass. There's room there where my children can play and grow and get to be good citizens. Medgar Evers, a Negro, said that. Our program in the history of the Negro People series deals with the life of the Negro in the South, in the past and in the present. The past is never dead, William Faulkner wrote. It is not even past. This is Oxford, Mississippi, where the past is preserved in granite monuments that record a tragic and glorious history. But in Oxford, the past lives beyond images etched in stone. It survives in the memories and in the myths of its people. Yet Oxford is an ambitious community facing the promise and the problems of the 20th century. Perhaps Oxford can best be described by its mayor. Oxford consists of some fine people, both colored and white. It's a town of about 6,000 people, uh, people that like to uh, tend to their own business, and they like to try to help in every way possible in the civic affairs, in the church affairs, and try to build a better community. Oxford is, in my opinion, is one of the finest little communities to raise a family. We've been used to uh, more or less a segregated life. This is something that, uh, that our colored people here are adjusted to, they are happy, and they're well satisfied. A lot of them depend largely upon the white. And I would like to say this, that the, the white people here uh, depend largely on them for help and so on. And they will go to their aid. That's, that's what the colored people like. They like uh, someone that if they get in trouble, sickness, uh, that church should burn or something. The white people here step in and they help them out and, uh, and the colored people appreciate it. There are 1,600 Negroes in Oxford, mostly unskilled, and there are a few jobs except as janitors, cafeteria, and yard workers. In the Negro quarter, large families live in two and three rooms. As in most southern communities, 
Negro women are the main support of the family, working as maids, washwomen, and nurses. 73% of Oxford's Negroes receive some form of welfare relief. At the Mary Bowie Museum, Oxford's most celebrated citizen, William Faulkner, is memorialized. Mary Rowland is the custodian of the museum. As Faulkner described so vividly, she shares with most white Southerners a sense of intimacy with their Negroes. The fact that we have a good set of Negroes here, and they don't want to be disturbed. They really are. I have one that I just love. She nursed my children for about six years, and I wouldn't have her want for a thing if I found out that she needed something. And I was right amused when my um, daughter from Arlington, Virginia, came down. She was one of the children that Missy had nursed. And I got my son to drive us out to see Missy. And she had also nursed him. And his little boy was in the car with us. And when Missy came out, she said, look at my children. And she put her arm right around William's shoulder. And the little boy just looked up at her, you know. He didn't know what to make of it. And I said, listen, Billy, oh, she was a mother to him for a while. I'll tell you, she's helped nurse him. And so that's the, the association we had with them. And I presume there's still some good ones around. Of course, there are some getting some ideas, and that's all right. That's progress. But uh, we've got some mighty good donkeys here. Progress in the South has always been measured by the darky and by cotton. First there was tobacco, rice, and indigo to be worked. But by the end of the 18th century, there was a severe depression. Slavery seemed doomed. Then, in 1793, the invention of the cotton gin. Cotton could now be mass produced, and an economic boom was in the making black hands and black backs were needed again to support a land. Who else could work so hard, so long, and so cheaply? But there were dangers in the system. Slaves could run away, or fight, or kill. And so, black codes were established that declared slaves were not persons, but property. These chattels could not leave the plantation without authorization, they could not visit the homes of whites or free Negroes. And for those who had the courage or the foolishness to defy the code, there was the whipping post, branding, prison, or death. As the country moved toward war, white men had established a moral system to meet their needs. At the heart of it was a belief in the Negroes' natural inferiority. Slavery was declared not only an economic, but a social good. South Carolina's governor said, in all social systems, there must be a class to do the menial duties, to perform the drudgery of life. Such a class you must have, or you would not have that other class, which leads progress, civilization, and refinement. And the North destroyed all this, all the gentility and pride and honor that white Southerners called a way of life. More than 600,000 died in the war. One quarter of a million Southerners. Black men also fought and died. Of 186,000 Negroes who enlisted in the Union Army, 38,000 died. The South lay devastated. Hell has laid her egg, said a Georgian visiting Atlanta. Right here it hatched. Galveston, a reporter said, was a city of dogs and desolation. Utterly godforsaken. Uh, after the Civil War, everybody in this country, in the Mississippi Delta, was bankrupt. Uh, all the chattels were gone, the cotton and whatever cotton had been ginned or stored was burned. And this country was destitute. And of course the slaves, the freed uh, 
Negroes were just as destitute as the landowners. And they were both in a pretty difficult situation. Four million Negroes were free. Free under the Federal Reconstruction Acts for the first time to own their own homes. Free to go to school. Free to vote and hold public office. The first mixed jury in the South was impaneled for the trial of Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Half of the jurors were Negroes. Before 1901, 22 Negroes were elected to Congress. There were two Negro senators from Mississippi. 33-year-old Blanche K. Bruce was one. John Mercer Langston, a Negro abolitionist, who became a representative from Virginia. B.S. Pinchback, acting governor of Louisiana. There was graft and corruption. But during this time, Negroes were influential in passing bills for free public schools, abolished property qualifications for voting, and ended use of the whipping post and branding iron. Today, these laws still exist for everyone but the Negro. I think the thing that Reconstruction did um, was not as important as the fact that the, the slave was now free and a place had to be found for him. And uh, the, the number, the sheer number, you see, of these untrained people, well, it was a tremendous problem. A tremendous problem that has always haunted the South jobs for Negroes. Negroes who were often stronger, more capable for the work required. A laborless, landless, and homeless class, Lincoln called them, caught in a hazy realm between bondage and freedom. But in 1866, Union General Hatch said, at issue in the South is not what shall be done with the Negro, but what shall be done with the whites. They were the victims of poverty, and poor land, of malaria and hookworm, about whom the Negroes used to sing, you can't make a living on sandy land. I'd rather be a nigger than a poor white man. And to these whites, there was horror at the specter of black supremacy, blacks winning control and competing for what had been exclusively theirs, lands, homes, and jobs. Birth of a Nation, a movie classic produced in 1915, dramatized what had now become the prevalent white attitude, the fear of incompetent, criminal, and savage Negroes who, with federal bayonets, ravaged an innocent South. And so, to save the South, the Ku Klux Klan organized in 1865 on horseback with guns, sword, and the cross, they terrorized Negroes and their sympathizers with violence, arson, and murder. Today, though their techniques have progressed to air-conditioned limousines, they are still active, still dedicated to their faith that Jesus Christ was not a Jew, that the Pope of Rome is Antichrist, and the Negro is a beast who must be suppressed. To describe that bunch, I'd have to use a whole lot stronger than I'm permitted to use being a minister of the gospel. Amen. They go into the auditorium of the gymnasium for the, uh, for the after football game dance. Then comes along one of the nigger football players and they all go piled in there together like that you are here tonight, just like a bunch of OICs and bunch of hogs all trying to loosen a lot together. <laughs> they go in there and they get to rubbing around and Smelling that vanilla flavoring. <laughs> could you conceive the idea of your fair-skinned daughter? Her dancing partner be tagged on the shoulder <laughs> by some fur-head, liver lip, goat-smelling, eight-faced nigger. <laughs> Can you conceive such a thing? Reverend W. N. Redmond, as most Southern Negroes, has been an eyewitness to the vigilante system of Negro control. At 14, he remembers the punishment of a Negro father and son who had killed a white man's dog. They took him and put him in jail and they beat him. 
And then they got together on a Saturday. And they tied them with barbed wire, hand and feet. They put barbed wire around the neck and put the father on one side of the bumper and the Negro and the son on the other side of the bumper. They drug them all over the, the uh, town. And uh, after that, they were drug to the neighborhood, the Negro neighborhood. They were told that this is the way that we're going to keep the Negro in this place. And they took gas, gasoline, and they poured it on them, and they burned them up. Freedom and truth for former slaves required new definitions. Sheriff Boyce Bratton comments. I feel that the Negro here in Lafayette County in Mississippi has freedom, all the freedom he wants. He's not tied by uh, any laws, uh, man-made laws, or uh, made by Congress or any other lawmaking body. He has all the freedom that he wants. The Negro is not uh, deprived of any uh, freedom here in Mississippi. Jim Crow, it was called. Beginning in 1870, signs went up all over the South separating the races and taking away the Negroes' newly won rights. Negroes and whites were separated on trains and buses. Negroes were barred from white hotels, restaurants, barbershops, and theaters. I've also, also heard uh, a number of times that the colored and the white were not equal under the law. That's true. The colored gets the break and the white man doesn't. For instance, two men, one white and one colored, breaks into a store here. In all probability, the colored man would get a very light sentence and the white man would get a heavy sentence. Now, that's not equality under the law. But it goes back to the thing that uh, I said to start with, that the white man of the South feels like it's actually his job to look after the, his colored uh, citizens or the colored citizens. And they are not held accountable uh, to the same stringent letter of the law that the white man is. That no amalgamation of races should be allowed. In other words, they did not commit in a marriage. It was made death to maim or kill a horse or a cow or a slave. By 1885, separate schools were the new order. At white and Negro schools, children, using the same textbook, learned the traditions of the past and absorbed the values of the present. In their history of Mississippi textbook, they read of life on a Mississippi plantation. The master and the mistress taught the Negroes truthfulness and honesty as they taught their own children by not tempting them and by trusting them. With Negro slaves, it seemed impossible for one of them to do a thing without the assistance of one or two others. Of course, some kind of occupation had to be devised to keep them employed a part of the time, but it was very laborious to find easy work for a large body of lazy and inefficient people. And in their churches, too, white southerners sang and prayed to a god that to them decreed segregation. Well, certainly, I, I believe in, uh, in segregation. I uh, have stated that, uh, that I have believed in it. I believe in it now, and I always will believe in segregation. First, uh, uh, because God teaches it. I think it's God's plan that the races be segregated. We find a lot of scripture on it. And uh, for s reasons that I've just mentioned, that I feel that their standards is not up to the white standard. I'm not going to force somebody to go to church with me. Uh, and that's what they're trying to do to the colored race. That's what the outsiders is trying to do. They're trying to come down here and force them to go to our church. I build a house. I have a right to live in that house. You don't have a right to come in and move in with me. I build a church. It may be this house of the Lord. But yet, I maintain if I build it, I have a right to say who, and who will and who will not come in. Remember, it's come by invitation only. By invitation only, 
became the right of Negroes also, as they found ways to live as free men in the South. Seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintance. Walk circumspectly. If you're just, ah, somebody know it. And if you're just in your dealing, ah, it'll soon be that folks will take your word. But if you're unjust in your dealing, won't nobody believe nothing you say. See what I mean? In 1895, Booker T. Washington declared, in all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand, and all things essential to mutual progress. By the end of the century, segregation was complete. The new South rose out of the ashes of the old, and the good nigger was the one who once again knew his place. I'm just a white folks nigger. I'm a nigger and all of my children's a nigger. And all this community in here of Mississippi recognized, appreciated, and worked for the white folks. He's not, the nigger is not a part of my family. As a result, I don't elect to have him sit and eat with me. As a result, I don't elect to have him belong to a club that I may belong to. I, I don't elect to be for Judge Obar, as for most Southern whites, out of the past has come a philosophy he calls the Southern way of life. The Negro and his place is at the heart of it. This is the way it has been. It's the history of the South. It's because we've been brought up like this. We have been taught like this. And we teach our children like this. And they'll teach their children like that. I think it is a matter that has been history all down through the years and will remain history. Well, I guess it's just plain born in us, instilled in us. Um, there, in spite of the fact that you have great respect for some Negro individuals, respect them as people, and not just as a servant, um, there is some physical revulsion, I think, that the, the, the skin is dark. And I guess it's just something that we are so um, familiar with, it, it's just impossible, really, to overcome it. For 11 million Negroes in the South, there is also a Southern way of life. But rarely have they been asked for their interpretation. Well, uh, the white man fears this, that if the Negro get equal education, then he will be out of his reach for to do the job that he year before have done for him, and he figured that uh, he was going to have to pay the Negro equal salary, that he would have to pay the other boy which actually is not the skin of the Negro that the white man dreads. It's the Negro is going to demand the dollar that the white man demands. Uh, the Southern way of life for the uh, Negro woman means that uh, she is addressed all the time by her first name, or she's called Auntie, or she's called Girl by the uh, other race. And the southern way of life often means that 
our children wear some of the things that have been uh, given by others. Now, a lot of times these are good things and they are highly appreciated. And the Southern way of life means that you can uh, purchase food from a side entrance or a back entrance. Or you can get someone to fix something for you to carry out. The Southern way of life uh, means that uh, you are to say uh, yes ma'am and uh, yes sir and no ma'am and uh, no sir. Sometimes that's expected even down to the uh, teenagers. In order to segregate the Negro, we uh, uh, essentially must segregate ourselves, you see. Uh, you cannot en enslave, if you want to use that word, or hold down or discriminate against someone else without in turn uh, having the same thing happen to yourself. Uh, the changes that will happen uh, uh, as they go along uh, will release us, free us, if you will, uh, so that we can have a, a much broader uh, perspective on human responsibility and human dignity and human rights. Uh, whereas before we, we thought in terms of white only, uh, we will be able to think in terms of, of all, of all men. We live in hope. Uh, we have faith to believe that uh, the good things that we hope for as human beings and as God's children will finally come to pass. So uh, that's a part of my Christian life here in the way of life here in the South. Oh, touch me, Lord. Touch me. As we moved into the 20th century, for the older generation of Negroes, there was often only patience and faith in the future. But in the middle of the 20th century, for the younger Negroes, something else was stirring. Something that would change the South and the Southern way of life. Something that was a long time a coming and was too explosive to contain. Touch me. Touch me, Lord. I want to be home. National Educational Television Network.